The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Budgets in Ontario normally come down in the spring, but nothing is normal this year. And so it was only just last week that the province issued its full, very costly fiscal plan. Tonight, we get a take from economists on whether it's enough or too much spending to keep Ontario's economy afloat. Then, Nick Kiprios was one of the toughest guys in the NHL. His career ended in horrifying fashion. He talks about that and more in his new memoir that pulls no punches on being an enforcer. It's Monday, November 9th, and that's next on The Agenda. Last week on Budget Night, we heard from the Finance Minister, the Opposition Critics, and the world of small business. Tonight, we follow up by hearing from three longtime policy analysts. What's their take on a budget that will spend more money and go deeper into deficit than any previous budget and by a mile? Is it enough to save the economy? And will it be worth it when those bills come due? Let's ask. In Burlington, Ontario, Craig Alexander. He's Chief Economist and Executive Advisor at Deloitte. And in the provincial capital in Little Italy, there's Sheila Block, senior economist at the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. And in Riverdale, Drew Fagan, a former deputy minister of the Ontario government, now professor at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the U of T. And it's great to have you three on our airwaves again. Let us, I was just about to say, in case you missed the finance minister's speech last week, but I'm pretty sure you three did not. Uh, but on the chance that some of our viewers did, here's Rod Phillips from last week. Sheldon, if you would. Ideally, governments, like families, budget prudently during good times in order to have flexibility in tough times. Unfortunately, that didn't always happen in Ontario. But the good news is that our government made significant progress towards a sustainable financial path before COVID-19. That progress enables our $45 billion response as outlined in today's budget. As the people have understand, the current level of government spending is neither sustainable nor desirable in the long run. But as a global pandemic continues around the world, it is absolutely necessary today. Mr. Speaker, our deficit is projected to be $38.5 billion, unchanged from what I reported in the first quarter finances this summer. We are projecting that the deficit will decrease to $33.1 billion next year and $28.2 billion the following year. Now, I have heard it said in politics that uh, the public can get its head around the notion of charging taxpayers 16 bucks for a glass of orange juice, but $38.5 billion is just too big a number and too incomprehensible for anybody to understand. So that's where we bring you three in. Sheila, start us off. How should we react to a number that big? I think we really have to put that number in context. We are facing a public health crisis that we really haven't seen in this country for at least 100 years. We are facing uh, an economic crisis that uh, is a result of that public health crisis. As a result, the demands on government are much larger uh, and needed uh, than they have been since that time. And so I think that's the kind of context that we need to take this into. And a lot of our regular met metrics um, will be hard pressed to compare them to. So I absolutely think we have to take it into that bigger context. Craig, what's your view on it? Uh, the reason you run uh, prudent fiscal policy during good economic times is so you can actually afford to respond to, to a crisis. And I think the real challenge that Ontario has had is that heading into the, the pandemic, its, its finances were extraordinarily weak. And as a consequence, this has constrained their ability to respond. But nevertheless, the government did absolutely the right thing. It did a 180 degree shift from being a government that was aiming to balance the books in 2023 to a government that was willing to accept uh, record deficits for several years. And so if you think about it, pre-pandemic, pre, pre the government was running a deficit of $9 billion or tracking a $9 billion deficit this year. It's now going to be $38.5 billion, but that's the price tag for fighting the pandemic. And so it's completely understandable, it's reasonable, 
And, and while the government's finances are unsustainable, it, it, it's something that we had to accept. So it's really going to be a challenge as in terms of the path forward. But the government is trying to be pragmatic in terms of balancing how big the deficit gets and also addressing the pandemic. Drew, in any other times, in other words, in more normal times, this kind of number would be unthinkable. And so my question for you is, in your conversations with your former colleagues in the public sector or you know, in government or in academia or in the world of economics, do you find anybody today who's saying, oh my goodness, $38.5 billion, that number is outrageous and unacceptable? Well, I think there's concern about the number. Um, it's, it's, it is you know, a record deficit, and it's high even compared to previous crises. So it's twice what the deficit was during the financial crisis of 2009-10. And it took years for that deficit to decline. In fact, we never really got back into the black. We got to the edge of that a few years ago. So the Part of the challenge is the size of the deficit at $38 billion and, and the expectation that it'll take years to get that deficit back under control. As Craig noted, the government, this new government had a plan to balance the budget by 2023-24. Now that's out the window. It's likely to take a few more years. And that is challenging in the medium term, as, as uh, Minister Phillips admitted. Sheila, it's going to take probably more than a few years to get back to balance. There's no plan to get back to balance in this budget. The government, I guess, intends to pass a law, giving them an exemption from the law that requires them to show a path back to balance. Do you find that problematic? I think what I mostly find problematic is if it's a government that is concerned about getting back to balance, um, why did they bake a billion dollar a year tax cut uh, into this budget? Um, so I think absolutely I, I agree with uh, Craig that government needed to step up. It did step up. We're not certain whether it stepped up in the right ways or sufficiently. Um, but if you want to get back to balance, you have to look at both sides of the led ledger. And this budget included permanent tax cuts and temporary spending measures. Hmm. Craig, are you as offended as Sheila with those billion dollars worth of tax cuts? Oh, I think the tax cuts that the, are in the budget are basically part of the effort to help support businesses during during these difficult times. And, you know, as is as is the electricity subsidy that was also provided in the budget. I mean, if we think about the, the, the impact of the pandemic on businesses, the federal government's doing a lot of the heavy lifting through things like the, the wage subsidy for businesses that have had a, a large drop in their in their revenues. Um, the federal government is also has also expanded access to credit through um, Business Development Canada and Export Development Canada. And so there, there is a lot of federal efforts to help support business. So I really think what the, the government did was sort of look at what, you know, what could they do to, to, to reduce the cost of a cost on business in the near term. And so, you know, those tax cuts are part of that effort. Drew, you want to break the tie here? Yeah, well, a billion dollars is not insignificant, but, you know, and it's it's a big number, but it's on a base of $150 billion with regard to the size of the spending generally or a little bit more. So, you know, by and large, what they've done here is increase spending um, to a great extent. Even, you know, some months ago, they were planning for an increase in $20 billion in spending. Now it's bigger still. Deficit hasn't changed from a few months ago, but it's substantial, right? So whether they got the balance right, it's largely been on the spending side. There's another point to make, I think, with regard to the deficit, and that is we really need to think of the federal deficit and the provincial deficit together. And we're now, in terms of debt as a share of GDP, at about 100%. The debt of the federal government and the provincial government is roughly about the size of the economy. That's a big number. And it's not that we can't handle it now, but if there, as you noted earlier, a trend in the medium term with regard to a continuing and taking years to get it towards zero, that could pose a real challenge. Well, that's a good point. Let me pick up on that because, uh, as Drew correctly points out, there's, there's a number of different ways to measure the size of a deficit and or debt. Uh, one is the pure number. $38.5 billion is a big number. The other way to measure it is as a percentage of the gross domestic product, as a percentage of the, the value of the economy. And on that scale, the debt-to-GDP ratio is going from 39.7%, which is where it is right now. This is Ontario only 
to 49.6%. There, we've got the chart up right now. 39.7% today, going within a few years up to almost 50%. And I guess I want to know whether or not that rings alarm bells for any of you. Sheila, how about that? So um, perhaps unsurprisingly, it doesn't ring too many alarm bells for me. And there are a couple of reasons for this. I, I go back to this is an unprecedented time where we really need governments to step up. The second thing to note is that the cost of borrowing has actually decreased. And so Despite the big increase in the deficit, the Ontario government's interest costs have not increased uh, from last year to this year. So that's how much that cheaper borrowing is having an impact on the affordability of carrying that debt. And I think the third issue is that we've seen that both the federal government and the Bank of Canada have really indicated a willingness to step in and step up and support provincial governments. So. Um, well, I, I don't find this alarming, and I think it's really an indicator of how things have changed. If you would have asked me this um, pre-pandemic, I might have had a different uh, answer to your question. No, I understand. But uh, Craig, let me get you to follow up in this respect. We're going to borrow $12.5 billion this year to pay off the interest on our debt. And we're going to pay the same number next year, despite the fact that we're going to borrow $38.5 billion more. Uh, which does go to show you that we're really catching a good break when it comes to low interest rates. So by that measure, should the debt to GDP ratio scare us as much as some people are afraid of it? Well, it shouldn't worry us as much as if, 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 as if interest rates were higher. So the debt service costs are not, are not insignificant, but because interest, interest rates have fallen so much, it's actually allowing governments to carry much bigger deficits and debt loads than they have in the past. But that still doesn't mean you, you shouldn't be mindful of, of the amount of, of debt that governments are taking on. So, for example, in the budget, the government says that in 2022, it expects to be paying roughly $14 billion in interest on the debt that, that it's issued. That's, that's $14 billion that's not going into education or health care or other social priorities. And so even, even with a sustained low interest rate, the, the amount of debt that's being taken on is going to carry a cost. And yes, the, the Bank of Canada is currently buying significant amounts of provincial debt, helping to keep interest rates low. But the reason they can do that is that money isn't circulating like normal. You know, so one of the questions I often get is, you know, with the, the Bank of Canada buying federal and provincial debt, is this going to cause inflation? Because what they're effectively doing is increasing the amount of money in, in the financial system. And the answer is that it doesn't cause inflation when the money isn't going into spending and investment. And if you look at, for example, uh, household finances, the amount of, of deposits that, that Canadians have has gone from $50 billion pre-COVID to $416 billion. And that, the, what that does is it really shows you that the money in the system isn't flowing normally. And so ultimately, there's no question that these are enormous deficits and, you know, and Ontario is adding a lot to debt. Interest rates will remain low, and that means that it's affordable in the near term. But we do have to recognize that one of the great legacies from fighting the war against COVID is going to be a lot of Ontario debt. Drew, let me get you to pick up the story from there. In, in this respect, uh, these progressive conservatives obviously did not get elected back in June of 2018 with a view to bringing in uh, the largest spending budget of all time and the biggest deficit of all time. In fact, they were brought in to put the books back into shape. So for, uh, put your former deputy minister's hat back on right now and give us a sense about how the public service is reacting to having to deal with stuff that they certainly never saw coming down the pipe when this government first got elected. So first of all, I was talking to a former colleague this morning and she noted they're working around the clock, right? I mean, they're lucky to be in the position they are with, you know, solid jobs and responsibility, but it's hard work right now, working through everything. And of course, they had to respond um, in March and throughout in the same way the political class is, has by, you know, changing their stripes in effect or changing their perspective. And it's been all hands on deck for the last little while. You 
know, so it's it's the question is kind of part of it is their coordination and how hard they're working with regard to this. Part of it is working with their political leaders as they change their perspective. And, you know, I, I think the finance minister recognizes the challenge they're in. The government has tried to thread that needle. You know, one statistic that can jump out at people when you say it, and it maybe sounds a little scarier than it is, is Ontario's the most indebted subnational government in the world. And you heard that rhetoric from the PC party when it took power and during the election campaign. Part of that is because Canada is a very decentralized country and there's a lot of responsibility at the provincial level. But certainly within the bureaucracy, there's a focus on the programs that we need to uh, you know, roll out to deal with this uh, crisis, but also a focus on how you respond in, you know, economists call the medium term. How do we grow back better? How do we grow faster as an economy? Because the longer term challenge for Ontario is it doesn't really have as a competitive an economy as it should have. Our GDP per capita, our living standards aren't as high as surrounding jurisdictions. And I think that's the was to be the focus of the government, this government and the bureaucracy. They've been knocked off that by the crisis. I think they'd love to get back to that because the truth is we've had a generation in which we've been on a slow and steady decline province-wide. Sheila, can I get you to react to this notion of whether you think the public service is up to the task of an hist I mean, these are simply unprecedented times for anybody uh, who's in the public service today and whether they are up to the task of dealing with it. What do you think? Well, I think what we've seen throughout this pandemic is how public servants have, in fact, stepped up. Um, and uh, we've seen at the federal level policies being developed and being refined throughout. I think my question would be more how much are um, civil servants being uh, constrained in what they can do creatively and in what the, how they could respond by um, by by their political uh, leadership. And I think this government um, has hung back and is, uh, you know, we had a um, the report from the Financial Accountability Office that said 97% of spending in Ontario for the pandemic has been uh, as a result of the federal government, 3% from the provincial government. Um, we have seen this budget is, looks a lot to me like an open for business um, budget. So absolutely, I think we need some very creative solutions to deal with what I think the two fundamental dilemmas that have that the pandemic have exposed here. One of which is that we have a great deal of inequality in our economy. And the other is we have very threadbare, uh, both social safety nets and public services. And um, I believe public service, service servants are up to the task, but they need their political um, leadership to uh, unleash them. All right. That's where I'll get Craig to pick up on the next part of the story, which is, uh, uh, you know, basically every government in the Western world right now is spending uh, bigly, if I can steal the line, uh, bigly, trillions of dollars in order to fight the ravages of this global pandemic. Uh, the, the question we've got to ask is, are they spending it on the right things? You've seen, Craig, how the government intends to spend $187 billion over this fiscal year. Are they spending it on the right things, in your view? Well, one of the areas where obviously spending has gone up enormously is, is in the healthcare system. And, you know, first and foremost, we're fighting a pandemic, and that has to be job number one. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think Ontario's big challenge is that we, we you know, we're seeing rising infection rates right now. The the infection rates have increased quite dramatically as we've gone through the reopening, as kids have gone back to school, as the wind, as the colder weather is arriving, and as COVID sort of fatigue has set in. And so one of the great concerns from an economist's point of view is, you know, are we going to be able to keep our businesses open and, and at the same time manage, manage the health risks? I think that, you know, one of the lessons that we have from other jurisdictions is that what we really need to see is more testing and also contact tracing. Now, the, the federal government is providing a, a, you know, funding in that area, uh, but I have to be honest, I'm an economist, not, 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 not a health expert. So I don't actually know 
whether we're investing enough in the healthcare system at the moment. I don't know. You know, this is a you know, we're talking about a budget, and a budget is about you know where you're spending money. So if you told me that you know the the amount we're spending is 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 restricting our ability to do uh, testing and contact tracing, well, I'd say we need to spend more on that. But if the answer is that money isn't the challenge, well, then 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 no, we don't. So it's it's hard during a pandemic to actually look at the the government finances and say, you know, are they are they exactly spending in the right areas? I mean, I think the first priority is healthcare. The second priority is is helping support the the economy. And so things in this budget that do that are things like um, promising funding to help support some hard hit areas like the tourism sector, like um, arts and sports and cultural and um, industries like that that are going to be hit the hardest and they're going to be the slowest to recover. And that was all in the budget. There were provisions in the budget budget for those things. And 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 similarly in the budget, there's money for um, skills training. And you know, we are going to have a lot of workers that are experienced long-term unemployment. We saw that in last Friday's job numbers. And so, as a consequence, we're going to need to help those workers upskill and reskill so that they can get back in the labor market. You know, the question might not be money. Uh, it could be that we need to actually do a better job in terms of aligning the skills that workers are getting with the labor market needs. So, you know, I think that the, the the government, I think this budget from a spending point of view is is trying to be pragmatic about the fiscal realities, but at the same time trying to invest in core areas. Like, you know, we've had a big shift in the economy to digital. So one of the big things that's in the budget is expansion of, of, of broadband and, you know, particularly in, in rural Ontario. And I think that, you know, given the shift to digital, given the shift to remote work, this is the right thing to do. So, you know, there's there's things to like and things to dislike in the budget, but you can see how they're actually trying to to invest in ways that support the economy and and deal with the health crisis. I, I would pick up, though, on the, the thought that the way we get out of this fiscal, um, you know, the, the fiscal mess we're in is ultimately a stronger growth. Well, let me get to let me get to Drew on we that. We need a because, pro-growth strategy. That's well, really what we need. You, you, you have read my mind because that takes us right to Drew Fagan because he's just authored a couple or co-authored a couple of uh, policy studies which basically offer a blueprint or a roadmap for the government of Ontario. Uh, I suspect you'd love them to take your papers and just steal all the ideas in there and enact them, Drew. But why don't you... Uh, you know, give us some of the bullet point highlights of what you think a smart Ontario government going forward would do to reignite the economy in the midst of this pandemic. Yeah, and and and, and to think about the future, let's just situate ourselves here. And I think it surprises Ontarians that are again, um, if we compare the size of our economy to states that we look to, Michigan, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, we've been hearing those uh, those states over the last week, um, you know, incessantly. Um, we're a smaller economy. We were the average size of the seven states surrounding us 30, 40 years ago. We are now the poorest as, you know, GD, average GDP per capita. I'm not saying at the low end and certainly the extremes of American society may not be something we want to replicate. But, um, and that comes out of weak business um, investment, weak R&D investment, um, you know, weak productivity. And, and those numbers have tracked for quite a while. What do we do to goose growth somewhat back to what we had 20, 25 years ago. Everybody's facing that, but we've been on a slower decline, slow, steady decline to a greater extent. And we need to think about inclusive growth. And and the people at Queen's Park, you asked me about the public servants, they're thinking about this quite a bit. And that was really what they were focusing on with regard to regulations, with regard to increased child care, with regard to infrastructure investment, we need to emphasize. We talked about broadband investment just a second ago. Huge amounts going into transit, highways to a lesser extent, and other sectors as well. But we have to ask ourselves whether we're making the right investments and doing it effectively. There's one other thing that really surprised me when we were looking at this, and that is about 30 of the 60 states and provinces 
in the United States and Canada have actually done growth plans, five-year growth plans. Some of us used to think of those as almost Soviet, um, you know, but it's remarkable that virtually half the states in the United States, red states as well as blue states, have done growth plans to emphasize the sectors and to focus on the sectors and subsectors that we should be thinking about more. And that might be something, Saskatchewan's done it, we looked at Illinois intensively, that might be something that Ontario wants to look at. Part of the challenge with Ontario is, is that um, even as we look out in Toronto and see the, you know, the cranes and the steady growth and the tech investment and things like that, almost all the job growth over the last decade in Ontario has been in Toronto and Ottawa. Outside those two centres, there's been almost no, no job growth. We really need to think about inclusive growth going forward. And that's really, thank you, that paper was all about. Inclusive growth. Okay, Sheila, based on what you're looking at, do you see policies being put in place that will bring us inclusive growth going forward? Um, unfortunately, I don't see it. And I, um, I think when we look at, again, the, the big picture from, uh, from this pandemic, it's racial inequality, it's income inequality, and it's really uh, what a frayed public service and public, sec public sector we have at the moment. And I think at this point with uh, infection rates uh, where they're at, um, that we really need to um, switch strategy. The government at this point is just hoping to have a private sector led um, both recovery and period to get us through um, the pandemic. We are nowhere close to the end of this pandemic, unfortunately. We need government to lead, and we need government to lead in terms of both econ uh, economic growth and in terms of addressing these huge inequalities, both in health outcomes and in um, economic outcomes. Craig, last minute to you on whether or not we're getting the policies we need for inclusive growth. Uh, we're, we're moving in the right direction. I mean, when we look at where the job losses have been, it's been disproportionately low paid workers. Um, and when we look at who, you know, what, what comprises the population that works within low paid jobs, what you can see is, you know, there's more women, there's more youths, there's more visible minorities, there's more uh, newcomers that are in those jobs. And so there's no question that this, this recession has had a very strong inequality dimension to it. I think part of the, the government response in terms of the, the you know the Canadian um, you know the Canadian emergency uh, income benefits where yeah. you're getting five hundred dollars a week you know basically what you're doing is you're 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 maintaining the income that that you're replacing the income that those low low income workers were making and so I think you know we are seeing pr programs and policies that are designed to address some of that inequality. One of the things that was in the federal throne speech was expansion of early early learning. I think one of the lessons from the current crisis is the importance of, of, of child care for letting parents work. And this actually creates a, an opportunity. Like this is an enormous opportunity for us to invest in, in high quality, accessible, affordable, early, early learning that will not only help parents, but also help build more resilient kids to be the workers of the future. You know, similarly, similarly, we're seeing we're seeing, you know, other other programs that are designed to sort of help break down barriers. Like this is the example on the skills side. Right. We need to not only invest in skills, but we need to ensure that the skills that, that workers are getting are the ones that the, that the the market needs. And so that's that's not a budget item. That's actually, a you know, a, a, a program configuration. Yeah. So and we and we do need like again this goes back to the build back better narrative, right? It, I agree with Drew. Ontario and Canada was not on the road to prosperity pre-COVID, right? We were having slowing trend rate of, rates of economic growth that were going to mean that standards of living weren't going to rise more than one percent a year, and that means that Ontarians wouldn't feel like they're getting ahead. And this is how you get political outcomes you don't want, like Brexit and 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 Trump. So, you know, we really need to change the trajectory. And the great thing about, you know, the silver lining of, of the pandemic is that it's creating the opportunity to have a really constructive conversation around change. How do we, how, you know, how do we build a more prosperous future? How do we break down barriers facing our people? How do we attract more investment? How do we get more capital spending? How do we boost 
economic growth. And, you know, I talk to businesses across the, across the country, and I am impressed by management teams really thinking about uh, how they're going to reform their business models in quite significant ways. Similarly, everything is on the table with government now. You can have a constructive dialogue about you know, what do we need to do to, to, to create more prosperity? We're going to lose a lot of small businesses. I think one of the priorities is going to be how do we foster more startups? How do we actually get more businesses reopened or started again or launched to make up for the businesses that don't survive the pandemic? Craig, I'm so jumping we- in here because the biggest reality is the clock, which yields for no person, no economist, including yourself. That's Craig Alexander from Deloitte, Sheila Block from the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, Drew Fagan from the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. Thanks to all of you for coming on to TVO tonight and helping us out with this. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Sarah. When Nick Kiprios played in the National Hockey League, he was never among the best players on the four different teams on which he played, but he did play 442 games in the NHL, becoming one of the infinitesimal percentage of kids born in Ontario to have that dream come true. It's also fair to say that Kiprios's career will always be remembered for the way it ended, which was shocking and brutal. It's all in his new book, Undrafted, Hockey, Family, and What It Takes to Be a Pro. And we're delighted to welcome to TVO from North Toronto, the guy everybody calls Kipper. Kipper, it's so good to have you on TVO. How are you? I'm well, Stephen. Thanks for having me. And I think uh, we've, we've had a couple opportunities to talk, but uh, earlier in a career uh, evolved around the business side, the CBA, not so much fun. Exactly. It's good to have you here talking about your career. And I want to start with with the kind of player you were in junior versus the kind of player you turned out to be in the National Hockey League. Because I, I wrote these numbers down because I, I was fascinated by it. You're playing in North Bay. You get 62 goals in 64 games. Another year, 49 goals in 46 games. These are phenomenal numbers. You are a big-time goal scorer. And then you get to the NHL, and it's not so much about the scoring anymore. You're one of the tough guys on the team. How and why did that transition happen? Yeah, that was a, it was a conscious uh, uh, effort on my part to kind of read the tea leaves. The one thing that I do know, uh, Stephen, that they're not patient people in the NHL. They'll give you a small window to score goals, and if you don't, then you move on, unless you're a first pick, and that that puts a lot of pressure on the scouts to uh, to show your organization uh, that you made the right choice. So you get a longer leash to try to score goals, but. Washington wasn't very patient with me, and I had a small window to score goals. It didn't happen, but I wanted to stay in the lineup, so I made the conscious effort to find other ways to contribute. Even all those junior years, Stephen, I was I was scoring goals. I, I like the physical aspect of the game. I hit a lot, and on occasion, I would fight. So it was just a real conscious effort for me to go out there and do that more at the pro level. Well, your level of commitment to stay in this game is perhaps best exemplified in the next story that I'm going to ask you to tell. You're at this moment with the American Hockey League Hershey Bears. Someone clips you across the face with a stick, cutting your lip wide open for more stitches than your doctor can even remember. you got five broken teeth as well. You spend all night long in a dentist's chair going through root canal as he tries to (laughs) fix your mouth. Two days later, you are back in the lineup with a face shield on, ready to play. And I want to know whether there was a little voice inside you, Nick, that at some point said, geez, this may not be such a good idea for my health. Was that voice there? Yes, it was there. What the hell am I doing here? Is anybody even watching? Does anybody even care? How close am I to the NHL? I'm not. I can't even stay in the lineup regularly. And to go back in that lineup uh, so quickly after my five root canals uh, a couple of nights before just showed me what the pro level is all about in terms of do it now or don't get that second chance. So they still had to decide whether or not I was uh, a good enough player in the American Hockey League. Forget about thinking about playing in the NHL. So I had to go in there and ultimately show them Uh, that I am worthy to be a a good player in the American Hockey League. Unfortunately, it didn't happen. And from that injury, I ended up getting sent back or at least making the decision to go back to my junior team as an overage year to try to build my confidence back up. Well, let me take you to a happier memory. Your first goal in the National Hockey League. What do you still remember about it to the day? Well, uh, original six team against uh, Detroit. 
I, I did it with uh, Doug Wickenheiser. Unfortunately, we lost Doug uh, uh, to cancer, uh, but a terrific guy. Alan May has gone on to do some tremendous broadcasting uh, with the Washington Capitals. He also assisted on that goal, but I remember it took me almost, I, I believe, 15 games, if I'm not mistaken, to get that first NHL goal, and I waited so long for it. Uh, I essentially waited since I was seven years old for it. Uh, 15 games seemed like a lot of time back then, but well worth the wait. You played for the Washington Capitals. You got traded to the Hartford Whalers. Once again, you got traded to the New York Rangers. Now, that's pretty cool. I want to know what it's like for a single man to be playing for the Rangers on Broadway. Yeah, it, like those reality shows, it's just, uh, <laughs> it's almost surreal. Uh, it was so much fun. And what I remember right from the, the beginning was Mark Messier, uh, true to every word they talk about him being one of the, the greatest leader in all of sport, welcoming me, making sure that uh, I was looked after in terms of what do you, where are you going to live? You know, what's your situation? Are you got a wife and kids? No. Okay, then come live in the city with us. It was my, it was uh, Mark Messier, Brian Leach, Mike Richter, pretty good company within six or eight blocks on the Upper West Side. And it was so important for Mark, uh, Stephen, to, to take the whole culture in of just not being a professional athlete, but being one in New York City, which means taking it all in. Broadway shows, restaurants, the culture, the museums, everything. It was possible to take it all in and still do a great job on the ice because prior to Mark Messier, it was one or the other. They were really scared about athletes or, or hockey players being in the city and then, obviously, having the distractions, Mark said, no, you can, you can do both exceptionally well. There's a lovely story you tell in the book. You know, Messier won five Stanley Cups with the Edmonton Oilers. And you ask him, how come you don't wear any of your rings, your Stanley Cup rings? What did he say? Well, I'll wear mine when you can wear yours. And that was a message to me saying, I don't care what I've done in the prior. It's all about the here and now. So he didn't want uh, to wear any rings uh, in front of players that didn't have one. He wanted the next time he was going to wear one to be the new one, the present one, the one that he could control, not the ones that are in the past. And I just thought it was one of the greatest things he could say to me and, and, and to many of our, uh, his teammates that hadn't won yet that this is about the next one. It's not about the five previous. Your coach on that team was Mike Keenan, who uh, coincidentally enough, uh, got his start coaching hockey at Forest Hill Collegiate about five minutes from this studio and then University of Toronto after that. You don't have a lot of good stuff to say about Mike Keenan in this book. You, you seem to think well, he played a lot of head games no. with you guys. I, I don't think that's entirely fair, Stephen, to be quite honest with you. I just, I just want to call it the way I see it now. He was always fair to me. He never challenged me. He never... Um, try to motivate me to the point where, you know, he talked down to me, but he did others. And it's, it's, it's been noted historically over the years. When it's all said and done, Stephen, we won a championship together and nobody could ever take uh, that away from us. And he was a good coach in so many different ways. But he had the, 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 the uh, tendency to strip guys down. I do mention that in the book with some of my teammates um, but it, it, if the means were, was about to, to get to a championship, then mission accomplished for him. W would I go back and change anything? Absolutely not. That's how hard of a price you have to pay to win a Stanley Cup. And, and uh, Mike was just a part of it. And you had to put up with what, the ways that Mike felt were the best ways to get the most out of the New York Rangers. Some, some players, it was really hard on them. Others, like me... He, he felt he could squeeze enough out of me and he didn't have to worry about me any longer. Others, he needed to lean on heavily. And, and that's what I wanted to bring across in the book, Undrafted. Well, in fairness, 1994, the Rangers have not won a Stanley Cup since 1940. So Keenan's job with Messier and you and others is to finally cross that finish line, which, had never, which hadn't been done in 54 years. You had actually not been playing in that Stanley Cup final, Nick, until game seven, the last game. <laughs> and one of the assistant coaches come up, comes up to you and says, OK, Nick, you're in. And I, I just can't imagine what that moment must have been like. What was it like? Uh, we were up in the Stanley Cup final three games to one against Vancouver, and everything seemed to be very, uh, really comfortable. And then we lost the last two games. And there was a, I wouldn't say 
a sense of, uh, of panic, but there was a, a lot of uneasiness uh, going through our team and that or uh, and the whole organization that we might blow this. And there just seemed to be a, a little bit of a, of a feeling from Keenan and, and the associate coach, uh, Dick Todd and, and Coley Campbell, maybe we got to just make a, a subtle change. Now, Joey Kosher was also battling a bad back. So it just seemed like a good opportunity to maybe change the energy up a little bit. You got to do something that every little kid dreams of doing and doesn't, but you did. You hoisted that Stanley Cup over your head to celebrate winning game seven of the Stanley Cup finals. What was that moment like? Yeah, almost like an out-of-body experience. It's all these collective thoughts in your head going back from the very first time you you put on skates and, you know, having uh, your, your dad watch you through the, the glass at, uh, uh, back then it was called Woodbine Arena at the Peanut Plaza. Um, it, it's just a, a revolving door of how many people it, it took to get you there. And uh, I had my dad, my sister, and my brother-in-law in the uh, in the stands. Uh, they made their way down towards me, uh, but it was very difficult. Madison Square Garden, the ice had been cir uh, circled with uh, police arm in arm with their riot gear on. So we had no idea what was going to happen. But the greatest thing about winning a Stanley Cup, especially in a city like New York, is sharing it with your loved ones, and then ultimately every New York Ranger fan who had waited for 54 years. <laughs> okay, I want to get into, the, 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 the parade in New York didn't last too long because you ended up getting traded again, this time to uh, your hometown team, the Toronto Maple Leafs, which was a beautiful thing. And I want to read a little excerpt from the book right now to talk about one of the more memorable nights you experienced as a member of the Leafs. Here we go. Jim Cummins, who was one of the true heavyweights at the time, breaks my nose with a roundhouse elbow. I started bleeding profusely. There was no question I was concussed, but I got back on the ice. About seven minutes later, I got into a fight with Cam Russell. Ten seconds after we left the box, there was a face-off. We lined up against each other. I took my stick and rammed it right across his head. We fought again. Now, Nick, many people would read that account and say that is a great example of everything that is wrong with hockey. Now, this is 25 years ago, admittedly, but tell me, w would you... Would you agree that what happened in that scenario I just described is problematic? Well, it is problematic because it's a double-edged sword for every hockey player. It's, I know my health is at risk and I know that there's gonna be uh, long-term repercussions and it doesn't matter to me because I am in the here and now. Now, what? I don't necessarily say in that book or, or what other athletes say is that that moment and that 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 character that I showed uh, management also earned earned me another contract. So what do you do as, as a player? You, you want to play. You want to stay in it. You want to make as much money as you can. And you're going to do whatever it takes to show that you have the character that, that you care enough to even want to do this. And I know it's an ongoing thing. It's a tug of war with the NHL today. Is how much do you want that 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 warrior mentality, and how much is too much? Uh, it's an ongoing dilemma that we have in professional sports, including every contact sport there is. Football goes through the same thing. How hard do you want the linebackers to charge the the quarterback? You still want that element that that. It, it, it sells, Stephen. That is a part of the sales job on what you love about contact sports. The fan still wants to sit on the other side of the plexiglass wondering, do I have the guts to do what he's doing? That's part of the sale. No, I appreciate that. And uh, Don Cherry's got a line which says, nobody ever goes to the snack bar in the middle of a fight. There's no question about that. I did actually, before picking up the book, before starting to read the book, I was, I was asking myself, I wonder if he's going to talk about the Grand Fuhrer incident. And, and you do. You do go into it in great detail. So I want to do some of that with you right now, because one of the most controversial moments of your career was a time when you're playing against the St. Louis Blues and you get cross-checked by a guy who's a lot bigger than you, actually. 
into Grant Fuhr. We're looking at the video of it now. There's P Chris Pronger cross-checking you into Grant Fuhr. You land on him. It wrecks his knee, and he is out for the year. And it was a tough year for the Blues to lose their great goalie because they were real Stanley Cup contenders at that time. Your old coach in New York, Mike Keenan, who's now the coach of the St. Louis Blues, accuses you after the game of deliberately trying to injure Grant Fuhr. I guess my question is, do you get sick and tired of trying to explain to people that, look, this was just an accident in hockey and I didn't go out there trying to hurt anybody? Yeah. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to carry that, you know, till the day they put me six feet under and the Blues fans will forever hate me. I thought maybe they, they could, it would die down a little bit with their championship, but no, they're still on me 24, uh, 25 years later on that incident. And I, I just... I, I, it's it's no different than how I explained it. It was a hockey play. Could I have avoided uh, Grant Fear? Yes, I could have. But when when a guy cross checks you and you're on top of the goalie, uh, it, it's to fall on him. Did I try to did I try to disrupt their team? Did I try to get Chris Pronger to take a penalty? Did I try to bother Grant Fear? Yes, 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 and yes. Did I try to injure him? Did I would I would I have liked to have seen him limp off the ice? And, and be in surgery, you know, a week or two weeks later. No, absolutely not. It's a play that I've done uh, countless times during my career at all levels. Never have I seen uh, a situation where a guy's knee's been taken out. That was the first one. I felt horrible. I still do. Grant Fear is a complete gentleman. I talk about um, coming to uh, a meeting with him uh, years after, thanks to Mark Messier in the book just to go show you what a, what a class guy he is. But I still feel terrible to this day knowing that uh, uh, he, he hurt his knee and needed surgery. I, I still get knots in my stomach thinking about it. Hmm. Well, if you get knots in your stomach thinking about that, you're probably not going to much like the next thing I'm about to show you because this is, as we alluded to in the introduction, uh, the, the way your career ended was one of the most shocking things I've ever seen. And I've seen a few games in my time. You and Ryan Vandebush, you're now with the Leafs. He's with the New York Rangers. The game is at Madison Square Garden. There is a moment where this fight could have ended. The linesman comes up to you and says, essentially, Kipper, you had enough, and you want to keep going. And as we roll the video of this fight, I'm going to read an excerpt from your book and how you describe it. I held out for one more chance to throw a knockout punch. It was a career-altering mistake. Ryan caught me with two successive punches. The first grazed my right shoulder, but the second was square to my cheekbone. And here it comes if you're watching the video. How I escaped with half of my face not caving in, I'll never know. And we stopped the video here, Nick, before the blood really gets bad because there may be young people watching this. I had passed out while I was standing. I collapsed, falling forward. I was unconscious without the ability to break my fall. My forehead hit the ice full force. I started to bleed all over the ice. That was the last night I tied the skates. Nick, when was the first time you got to watch the video of that fight? It was off of a media request uh, out of New York. And I had I'd been called and uh, countless times, and I always said no, no, no. But I knew eventually... Uh, none of this would go away until they had something in terms of uh, my take on, on a lot of what transpired. And, of course, it was an era, Stephen, when so much was around uh, violence and concussions all over again. And we had just gone through a, a scenario with Lindros and Pat LaFontaine and those guys battling hard. So it was um, it was important for me now to kind of start thinking about um, an early start of closure. Of course, I, I never really got it uh, on a three minute interview, um, but I needed to go back there and start dealing with it again. And you know, if I if I look at that first interview uh, back in uh, 97, 98, then I speak of meeting Ryan Vandenbush on um, on a Sportsnet series we did. Uh, a crisis on ice and then actually speaking about it in great detail in my book that just got released on October 20th it probably took me a good 25 years to put full complete closure on it because it was it was a very traumatic thing that happened to me when you saw that video i wonder if there was a part of yourself that asked 
yourself, holy smokes, I could have died there. Yeah, that was probably later on. Uh, I had that feeling again um, uh, with with Ryan with Ryan Vandenbush on the set of Sportsnet. But to be completely honest, it wasn't. I asked that question not on me, but if I would have died, how Ryan would have dealt with it. And you know, he spoke in great detail about how that event affected him moving forward. So there's a lot of dominoes in play here uh, when it comes to how that type of injury affects a lot of people moving forward. But it took me quite a long time to really put it in its proper place. And I think I concluded that in the book. When the linesman had that moment in the midst of the fight where you might have been able to sort of stop it, have them intervene, and the crushing blow never would have happened, why did you... Why did you uh, slough him off and prevent him from breaking up the fight? Because yeah. I wanted more. I got greedy. I, I, I wanted to be in a position where people would say, oh, you know what, he, he held on. I, I wanted the knockout punch. I wanted what he had, a decisive victory where I can go back to my bench and say, hey, I can do this. I can still be a, a, a guy that looks after, you know, the, the Matt Sundins of the world and... Uh, the Dave Ellett's and the Kirk Mullers. I, I can do all that, uh, but it, it just, it never came to be. And, you know, I'm, there's certain times in my life and certain times in the book where you just have to go for it, that you have to put it all on the line. I did it there. Uh, Pat DeBuzo, the, the linesman, was kind enough to come in, and uh, I, I, I shook him off, and that's, that's just the part of my history. I can live with it now. You can live with it now, but but I'm going to ask you to sort of uh, reanalyze it a little bit more because had you accepted the referee, the linesman's advice and broken up the fight at that moment, you'd have no doubt played several more years. You'd have made several million more dollars playing professional hockey. Do you, do you look back at it and say, holy cow, that was the worst decision I ever made in my life? No, no. I look back at it and say it's the best decision of my life because... Life is about uh, making the most out of opportunities. Without that incident, I don't get uh, an analyst job at Sportsnet. I don't get a chance to be one of the first people uh, that goes on a hockey show in 1998 and, and last 21 years. I am convinced without the sequence, sequence of events that happen in my life, this doesn't happen, this doesn't happen, and this doesn't happen. And quite possibly this interview right now doesn't happen. <laughs> I'm, I'm really, really happy and content with everything that's happened my last uh, 21, 22 years since that incident. Okay, fair enough. But, but then um, let me ask you something that you actually, uh, you, might be, you might have one paragraph in the book about this and that's it. So I do want to ask you about it here. Fighting in the National Hockey League. Now, all of what just transpired to you, we're talking a quarter century ago. Let's go to today. Do you think with the players being as big as they are now and with the game being as fast as it is right now, is there still a place for hockey, uh, for fighting in the National Hockey League? Not anywhere near to the extent that we had it. And, you know, the one thing that I do like about it, it, it seems to be evolving naturally and it, it's not forced in any way. Ultimately, the gatekeepers of this game aren't the owners. Yes, financially, we know what that they mean to the game. But the ones truly are the gatekeepers, are the ones that play it. And their voice in 2020 has been heard, and that's they still want to keep fighting in the game. But the numbers are way down, Stephen. They don't even fight remotely uh, close to what we did. I think, I think there's over 70% uh, of the games now in the NHL that have no fighting in them. Think about that. That is a huge number. But for those that feel like they still need it, at least it's there for them. If they if they feel like it warrants um, uh, an opportunity to do that and diffuse uh, emotion. So in five years, it could be out altogether. But if it is, it's because the players choose that. And, and that, I think, is is the best way to progress from here on in. Okay, let's finish up on this, Nick. You're, I think, what, 54 years old now? 
I am. Yes. 54. Okay. You still a, still an awfully do, pretty do guy, I, I got to say. No, you look damn good for <laughs> for 54 and a guy who's been through and I'm going to list it here. Five root canals, a 3-inch screw in your shoulder, a reconstructed right knee, a spinal fracture in your right leg, spiral fracture, excuse me, too many stitches yes. to count, and of course that career-ending concussion that we just talked about. So the last question is, how do you feel today? Yeah. I, some days are great and others you, you, you got some challenges. Um, but uh, overall, I, I think I still got out at age 32, which is relatively young today. And like you said, I could have gone on for two or three more years, maybe made another million, two million dollars. But I'm also, I, I think I benefit today at 54 years of age of only playing, you know, 450 games, 500 if you include some playoff games. And, and not 1,000 or 1,100 or 1,200 games. I think, you know, it's a remarkable feat to play over 1,000 games, and we know not many guys do it. But we also know that there's a price to be paid for 1,000 games. And I feel like I got out early enough where I could have those challenges of, of some days not being as great as others, but for the most part, still feeling really, really good. I... I ran the New York Marathon when I was 47 years old after all those injuries. And that, to me, is, is a, a big of a compliment, uh, accomplishment that I had as any, including winning the Stanley Cup in, in a different way. So I, I think I got out early enough, Stephen, where I could still be a productive uh, uh, adult uh, in, in my latter part. If I'm, to use a golf phrase, if I'm on the back 18 of my life, so far, so good. That's great. I really enjoyed the book, Nick. Uh, it, uh, Doug McLean, whom we work with, has the foreword in the book. It's called Undrafted, and we're really glad it's brought you to our, sort of to our studios at TVO, virtually anyway, uh, on this evening. Take good care, and thanks so much. Stephen, a big fan of you and, and what you do uh, uh, on your show. Uh, thanks for having me. And that is the agenda for Monday, November 9th, 2020. As President-elect Joe Biden tries to begin the transition to the Oval Office, tomorrow we'll hear from conservative never-Trumper David Frum on where America and the Republican Party go next. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.